So tonight, making the transition to mountaineering, this is a brand new presentation, um, like a lot of ours have been, but this one we've never really packaged this way before. So the intent is to talk to folks about how do you go from backpacking, skiing, camping, even rock climbing or gym climbing, how do you get the whole package together so that you can get out in the mountains? So that's my thought. That's what we're going to do. Um, there's actually a lot of information, so you'll need to hold rein me in a little bit because you know I, I could talk about this for a long time. Um, but we're going to try to catch the 10,000 foot level um, and uh, hit the highlights. So before we do that, I'd like to just do a brief survey around the room. Can you tell us your name and if you are making a transition to mountaineering or if you did, what sport you came from? How would you classify your former experiences in the outdoors? I'm Jenny. I'm not a member yet. Okay. Um, I'm interested in climbing from peaks, so that's my passion. Okay. And what do you do now? I mean, How would you classify yourself now? Well, I'm a hiker and cyclist. Hiker. Okay. Cyclist too. Not so much into mountaineering. <laughs> hiker. Okay. Ron, how about you? I'm Ron, and uh, I started off when I was in the military. I wouldn't classify that as camping. Okay. I'm forced <laughs> to do it, but uh, All right. while I was there. Um, now I basically do a lot of outdoor rock climbing, hiking. Okay. So camping and rock climbing, that's your background that you're coming from. Okay. That's that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm Jason, and I come from back, uh, backpacking. Backpacking? Okay. I'm Susie. I've done a lot of backpacking. Some long time ago, more outdoor rock climbing. Okay. Hi, Mary. <laughs> okay, Mary backpacking. All right. Ethan, uh, peak bagging, hiking. Peak bagging, hiking. Okay. Events, no, I remember yet. Uh, probably climbed Shasta before everyone went backpacking, but I think oh, really? I'm more of a backpacker. Okay. All right. Good. I love backpacking. Okay. All right. Okay, so good. That's a good diverse start. Okay, come on in. We have room up right up here or right over here. You guys, feel free to move the chairs around. There's no order here. Okay, good. Well, my start was um, also in backpacking. Um, so I want to. Um, I'll tell a little bit about my story, but we can kind of go through, start off with, you know, what are some of the reasons that you might do this anyway? Like, why not just stay backpacking, right? Or camping or for whatever. Question, sure. How do you classify mountaineering? What? I, I will definitely cover that. That's the next slide. <laughs> um, but briefly, it's the pursuit of, well, climbing mountains. Okay. So I'll, I'll get into a little more detail with that. But, um, <clears throat> why I thought about building a chart that said, you know, what it takes to do mountain climbing. And I thought about all the stuff that if he listed, like suffering, expensive, <laughs> takes a lot of time, risk of you know, <laughs> risky, uh, you know, all these things. And then I thought that it, it would look pretty appealing compared to, say, backpacking, where it is probably less risky, less demanding, less cold, you know, but then. Why would you do that if you compared backpacking to, say, watching Monday night football, which is even less risky, less demanding, better food, better accommodation. So you know, just because on, on a chart it says that it's, it's going to be hard or expensive or time consuming, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. So I, I abandoned that idea because then I thought I'd all convert you to, to Monday night football watchers <laughs> instead. So there, but there are there are rewards that go beyond. Um, the, the hard parts of it. So for me, the first part is friendship. How many of you have met um, through outdoor experiences have met really good friends, possibly lifelong friends outdoors? Show of hands, me, uh, all my hands and fingers, okay? And then how about personal growth? Have you experienced times when you found out something about yourself, about what you can do? So that's what mountaineering does. And then um, you get to go to some places that nobody else can go to, really. Okay, and there's only a few people who have the skills to get to these places. 
So that's what Mountain Ring does for you there. Also, you're going to have a hot bot, right? Physical, physical fitness will get you in shape. And mental and physical challenge is a part of it too. So if you like problem solving, you have an engineering mind or like puzzles, mountaineering is a great place to test that stuff out. You can travel and explore all over the world. There's places to climb and then there's a unique skill set that comes with it. So that's my kind of tick list. How about you guys? You got anything to add to why you would, what the rewards are for you? Any mountains you've climbed or any peaks you've summited? Why did you do it? Why not just stay home from Monday Night Football? What are the rewards? Castle Peak, the third turret. Drove by it for years. Right. Been out to the first one numerous times. Last year, so I got there. Yeah. How was it? Great. Was it rewarding? Yeah. Why? Um, the views. Um, the views. Okay. Feeling of accomplishment. Um, enough of a adrenaline rush to, you know, make you appreciate being there. And now, when you drive by, you can go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about you? Well, I was invited to go backpacking with my friend several years ago, and we came in the back way and went down the upper way, so many falls to the valley of the car. And uh, the thing that caught me was at the top, where we're looking, there's eight or nine people in your group. Uh -huh. and as you get down, there's more and more and more people. The thought came to my mind talking about the percenters. This is the one tenth of one percenters. Right. And uh, we get to see <laughs> <laughs> access to stunning and beautiful places is probably my number one. Yeah. And then uh, I'm afraid of heights. Oh, I nice. Get, I don't get to say that anymore. <laughs> yeah, my friends don't believe I'm not real scared to do that. So. <laughs> Great. Well, everyone has their own list, you know, of why you're doing it. Yeah, I think for me it's like the solitude of being off trail and cross country backpacking. I think that's like yeah. you know, really a lot of fun. Yeah. But there's times where you know I my confidence with my skills, fear of heights, stuff like that. I feel like I don't have the skills to really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. I did some this this summer and it was just awesome. Cool. It turned out to be one pass was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Okay. So off trail backpacking is what yeah. makes it worth it for you and Having an increased skill set allows you to go even further than you've gone before. Yeah. Okay. The um, thing that got me started in mountain ring was just that, that I would go to these places and I would say, I want to go up there, but there's no trail to that point. So I have to figure out what sort of skills will get me to there at that point. So to the definition, this is my definition. I, I've looked around for different definitions, but this is how I would describe it. It's a human powered pursuit. So that means helicopters are out, like getting to the top of a summit and a helicopter, that's not mountaineering, that's just flying. Okay, so it's human powered pursuit. I think we are allowed to use cars to get to the trailhead. So I, I, I almost put non-motorized, but that really doesn't count. So the human powered pursuit of significant topographic objectives, because some of them aren't mountains, they're hills, they're peaks, they're ridges, you know, and using a variety of skills. So typically that involves the list, ice climbing, rock climbing, Camping, backpacking, scrambling, glacier travel, orienteering, skiing, wilderness survival. You could add a lot of things to that list. I know people have used kayaking to get to objectives and bicycles, um, sleds. Uh, no, no, no sleds. No, no sleds. <laughs> um, whatever, <laughs> snowshoeing, you know, dog sleds. Those are all ways that you can do things to get your objectives completed. But those are the those are the big ones. So common pathways, like for me, it started off with camping. And that was in Boy Scouts and with my family. And then that led to not car camping anymore, but actually going somewhere on trail and, and camping, which is basically backpacking. Okay. And then from that, I started climbing hills around the places where we go backpacking to, you know, that would be peak, that's what we call peak bagging. Some of some of you mentioned that. Someone did over here. So peak bagging is kind of like mountaineering only. It's on a, a, a more intermediate level. Um, and soon enough, I wanted to start climbing in the snow and climbing rocks and scrambling. And, and when, you're, when you're at that stage, you're going to start mountaineering. So if that's where you're at, this is the journey I'm, I'm talking about tonight. So what 
no matter where you, where you come from, you're going to need a couple things. So one of them sitting here in this retail store is that you're going to need specialized gear. So if you look at the wall to my left, you'll see, and Gregor's unpacking mountain axes and ice tools right now. <laughs> you'll see, you know, uh, Rock Pro, belay devices, runners, crampons, ice axes, and then, of course, specialized camping and clothing equipment, backpacks, rock shoes, tents, ropes. So you're going to need that stuff. One of the benefits of the club is that we've already got this gear and we can loan it to you on official trips and trainings. You're also going to need technical skills training and practice. So you can do that by putting a note up in the gym, or you could plug into what we got going on and meet people and go out and do stuff, or put an ad in Craigslist or something. But this is a good way to, to do this is to find an organization that has a program for skills progression and be with those folks. Then also, you're going to need increased physical and mental fitness. I don't think it's possible to really enjoy mountaineering without training in some way. And not only physical, but I do mean a little bit of mental training. You need to be a little tough. Um, you also need to find people to go with. So there's another thing that, um, in particular, SMC can help with. But if you've got friends who are already climbing, that's a great start. And then lastly, you need some information and, and knowledge. A lot of it, actually. Um, I, I kind of started making a list of, of different things that are specifically needed, and I kind of started with the big stuff. The first thing is, just to get into more detail, is that you're going to need technical climbing skills. So how we break that up is snow, ice glacier, that's what we call SIG, and then rock, which is all things dry and hard. Okay, so loose rock, firm rock, steep rock, um, low angle rock, scrambling, rock climbing, that's all rock. And then everything else we classify as mountaineering, which is removing the technical elements. So that's everything else that's on the list. Wilderness navigation, um, interpersonal competency, clothing, planning, logistics, risk assessment, medical, first aid, avalanche, all that stuff. So I guess that's one way to look at it. You can kind of see there's technical portions, that's rock, ice, and snow climbing. And then there's non-technical, which we call in our training program mountaineering. Okay, some of that's a little bit confusing, but the mountain series training course is what we we talk about when we just that's what we do to have non-technical training courses for you guys. If you look at the list here, you'll see a couple of things I took some some time to describe. One of them is this third bullet, interpersonal competency. It's, a, it's really important that um, when you're climbing and you're in a stressful environment um, where there's a lot of variables that you're able to handle that stress. And some people crack under that sort of pressure or they start to start to crack a little bit. So it's, uh, it, that's important to, to take that as a little at a time. How many of you have had a stressful situation in the outdoors at some point? Show of hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep them up. Was it due to weather? Was it due to inadequate equipment? Was it due to poor decision making? Was it due to bad partner picking? <laughs> I see some hands, okay. All those things can happen, okay. So sometimes we focus on logistics and clothing and all that stuff. We, we forget about the people portion. That's important. You gotta, you, gotta work, you gotta be able to work with the people that you climb with and it can put your relationship under stress. So you gotta be able to handle that. But the rest of it's pretty straightforward. Um, does anybody know what uh, five bullets down, what orography is? That's a fancy word I threw in there. It's the study of mountain building or mountain formation. So you need to know a little bit about geology and formations if you wanna be informed about what's going on because that helps you in your climbing. Um, I'll also notice that I have this uh, quaint little uh, statement down here, the art of suffering. Has anyone heard of that before? The art of suffering. This is like the, uh, the the subtitle to mountaineering. The quote: "The art of suffering." What does that mean? Got any ideas? I know Leith does. <laughs> what do you think? Right. You know, because everything. I call it another way to put it. That's a little bit casting it in a in a lighter way. Would be the. It's hard fun. Okay, hard fun. So, you know, it's effort, it's difficult, it's somewhat stressful, it's demanding, um, but it's all hard fun. 
And, and through all of that, you are kind of really just suffering. You're, you're, <laughs> if you want to be a little bit negative about it, but so that's, that's what we, that's how we describe it sometimes, but you have to pay the price to get the reward. So it's the art of paying the price basically. And then the risk assessment's a big part of it. We'll discuss that briefly. And then I kind of lumped up a bunch of other stuff, first aid, medical, avalanche. There could be a lot more little discrete boxes of skills there, weather forecasting, um, so on. Okay. So just a little talk about um, the scope here, just to give you an idea about what is all involved in mountaineering. The traditional sense of it was just simply climbing mountains. And nowadays at its highest level, the fast and light, um, single push, world-class athletes, we call that alpinism or alpine climbing, okay? But it all started with just simply climbing mountains and that broke up into all these other things you see on the list here, ice climbing, glacier climbing, rock climbing, rock climbing fractured into a number of different things, aid climbing, free soloing, bouldering, gym climbing. So this is all confusing. How does this all fit? So this is how I describe it. Mountaineering is a huge umbrella, okay? And inside of that is a whole bunch of other discrete sports nowadays, okay? So in the first bowl, you'll see rock climbing. So that includes everything inside and outside the gym, no, no matter which way you want to climb, okay? Trad, sport, so on. Um, down that the other two on the left and the right there, to the left, you'll see everything that we do in mountaineering that doesn't involve ropes, okay? So that's bouldering, scrambling, and free soloing. That's climbing whatever level of commitment you like without any protective equipment, whether that's 10 feet or 10,000 feet, it's up to you. Um, then on the right is uh, systems and procedures in which you're actually climbing on the gear itself. So you're not free climbing anymore, you're climbing the equipment. That's why it's called aid climbing, like climbing El Cap and Via Ferrata, which is installed cables like they have mostly in Europe. Then the lower part down there is the whole cold icy part of mountaineering, which is ice, glacier, winter time, which is the off season and snow climbing. So if you take all of those together, that's the technical description of all of the skill set you're going to need for mountaineering. And they're all distinctive sports, but in my opinion, the only sport that allows you to practice them all, possibly even on the same route, is mountaineering. So here's the resource you should know about. How many of you own this book? Show of hands. Okay, the rest of you need to buy this book. <laughs> I don't know if, Gregor, do you have this book here? Not yet? Okay. Um, it's our textbook we use for trainings. It's the only, it's the tome, it's the reference. So it's just simply Mountaineering Freedom of the Hills. The eighth edition is the latest. It's the 50th anniversary. You can get it digital. It's great reading for when you're stormbound in a tent. If you get it on your phone, you can get all like, you know, 800 pages and go for it. So I do recommend you get that. Mountaineering Freedom of the Hills. It's been published for about 50, well, 50 years. Yeah, 50th anniversary. So. so a couple more things. What I'm going to do is kind of hit some highlights for you. One of the things you should know about is rating systems. Okay, so sometimes you'll hear people say stuff like, oh, it's only class four. Okay, so what does that mean? Or it's scrambling, so therefore it's class three. So how I like to describe it is class one is something that you can do with a wheel. Okay, so one, one thing. Class two would be two legs, okay? Class three would be two legs and an arm. That's scrambling. Class four would be both legs and both arms. And then class five would be both legs, both arms, and equipment. So trying to make it simple. Class five is where we, go, we get into technical climbing. And if it's rock, then it's rock climbing. If it's snow and ice, then it's snow and ice climbing. Class four is the kind of gray zone where you could get hurt, the exposure could be big, but some people would choose to solo it, you know, to climb it without protection. Here's an example. The Whitney Mountaineers route is so appropriately named, okay? It is a class three route. So it's beyond hiking, but it's not class five rock climbing. It's something in the middle. It's something kind of a scrambling. You can see a picture of us climbing it some years ago here. It's a hands are used for balance. A rope might be carried or even used. Um, it is a grade one, which is a technical uh, commitment grade, which means that it only requires a few hours to, to do the technical portion. So an easy route. Some other things to talk about, some risks out there. Um, we sometimes break this up, well, we should always break it up into two specific 
camps. One of them is things that exist out there without us and then things that we bring out there with us because we're people. Of these two, um, which do you think is more important? Everybody who thinks that objective risks are more important, and when I say important, I mean you need to pay more attention to them and they're more impactful <laughs> to your level of risk. Which, how many people think mountain risks are more important? Show of hands. They're important, okay. Nobody got, I, I, I can't dupe anybody. Okay, so you're right. So everybody thinks then that human factors are more important. You're certainly correct. Those are the ones that usually get us into trouble. So again, beware that when we start climbing, you wanna pay more attention to decision-making, um, inadequate skill, fitness, being casual, ignorance, distraction, all those things, rather than what jacket you should bring, whether the route's in shape per se, you know, what the weather looks like, although those have to be taken into account. Um, some of the ways we can manage risks, first off, understand what you're getting into, so I recommend going slowly. Um, make sure that you're <laughs> practiced in the art of decision making. You have to be informed and you've got to think rationally, even though the right decision might be really hard. Like, here's a story. Uh, one time I climbed Mount Stewart and this is my second attempt and on the descent, because I'd already been there once before, I was pretty certain that I knew where I was going and even though it was storming, there was a particular rock that I knew we had to make a turn to go back down to safety into the lower elevation and I swear that we did make that turn at that rock, but the compass said otherwise and we got down to the elevation, we discovered that we'd actually descended off the complete all wrong side of the mountain. So there was no way for us really to walk around. It would have taken us at least two days to get back to the other side. And yet there was a winter storm brewing. So we had to go 3,000 feet back up the wrong side of the mountain. We had descended and, des and descend the correct side this time. That was a hard decision to make, but I had to do it. So make sure that you're ready to do those things. <laughs> um, experience plays a good part. Um, and there's a little saying about um, good judgment comes from bad experiences. Have you guys ever heard that before? <laughs> so I can tell you that's really true, but it doesn't have to be your bad experience. Okay. You can learn from other people's bad experiences and have good judgment that way. So I would read something like Accidents in North American Mountaineering published by the American Alpine Club or True to Life Mountaineering Stories. Those are good too. So you know kind of what happens out there sometimes. Another element for risk is speed. So the more fit you are and competent, the less time you're gonna spend in risky situations. So there's another plug for working out um, as well as fitness. So let's take a look at um, inherent risks a little bit. Now, I, I'm gonna, I like this survey thing i go, got going on tonight. How many of you, I'll close my eyes even if I don't want to sway your vote, but how many of you would, would raise your hand if someone said to you, do you think mountaineering is risky? Would you say yes? If you would say yes, raise your hand. Yes. Okay, all right. All right, would you say that um, driving on the freeway is risky? Okay, all right. Would you say that eating a double-double with extra spread in and out is risky? Okay, you probably could, yeah. In the long run, they're all risky. And what, what, what matters is how much time you spend doing that thing and what your behavior is while you're doing it. So here's what we found out. I say we, I mean the mountaineering community over the last many years, the American Alpine Club has checked this out. So for every fatality in climbing in general, not just mountaineering, but all climbing that we've been tracking this win, there's 20 major injuries, 200 minor, 2,000 near missiles, and 200,000 unsafe acts. So you're gonna get lucky a lot. The thing to do is to reduce the number of unsafe acts that you and your team undertake, and then the rest of that will, can, will diminish. So, you know, when somebody gets attacked by a shark, we hear about it because it's, it's in the news, and my goodness, somebody got eaten by a shark this year. Well, there hasn't been somebody eaten by a shark in 10 years or, or 50 years or never at certain beaches, right? But yet when people go swimming, they think about the chance of getting eaten by a shark. But the chances of that are really, really small. I mean, they're about as small as tipping a vending machine over on yourself or getting hit by lightning. I mean, so it's all about your perspective. 
So if we can just realize that, yes, it could be perceived as risky, but fix that by our decisions, then it won't remove the risk, but we'll be safe. Er. So here's a couple things we're going to do. One thing we're going to plan, okay? We're going to make good decisions before we even get out there. We're going to set some turnaround times and some leadership goals and check our equipment. And if something comes up, we're going to discuss it as a group. We're going to have these little alarms that go on in our minds and in our, in our hearts too. And uh, the objective, number one objective, okay? There's three objectives in mountaineering. Number one is nobody dies. Also, I'd say nobody gets hurt, okay? Number two, we all come back as friends. So people are the next most important thing. And number three is we summit. So don't get those mixed up, okay? Summiting is not number one. That's priority number three. And people come before summiting, and safety comes before that, comes before people. So at least relationships. Here's a couple things that happen out there. You're going to see stuff and you're going to sense things. Your brain's going to tell you some things. You're going to have some intuition. And sometimes your gut is going to tell you stuff and you need to pay attention to that. Sometimes we have a sense and who knows exactly how this happens or where it comes from. That will leave that to psychology and spirituality. But you will feel, you'll have a feeling. Like Star Wars actors say, I have a bad feeling about this. If you have a bad feeling, pay attention to it. Okay. So all that, all that wrapped up together can help inform us so we can make good decisions. So. All right. So I'm, gonna, I'm going through a lot of different things here. <clears throat> Anybody got any comments or questions on risk or anything I've gone over so far? Any fun stories? Oh, I, we were actually climbing at Lover's Leap. My son was doing his first uh, multi-pitch. Yeah. Because, well, we had uh, three people got added to our group at the last minute. Okay. Somebody else knew. Well, we found out at the top of the first pitch that these three people didn't really know what they were doing. Okay. And my son started getting nervous. Okay. And he leaned over to me and he's like, this just doesn't seem right. Yeah, exactly. And he was getting concerned because they were talking about who's going to set the next anchor and all. And they're talking <laughs> about not tying. At right. The top okay. Of the pitch. And he said, I'm ready to go down. Yeah. That's and good. we lowered. Okay. Good. And, we, and, we, and I was fine with that. Yeah. Because it was, it was a decision he had to make. Good. Good. That, that's, that's responsible. That's good. Okay, good. Thanks. That's perfect. All right. So it, on the topic of risk management and assessment, we have a number of systems that we're going to use to keep ourselves safe. So I've tried to break that up into four things. Here, here they are. Simul soloing is exactly what it sounds like. You're just out there climbing. Okay. Running belay is moving together on a rope, but putting an intermediate protection. Belayed climbing is what you might think of when we talk about rock climbing. So it's a belay, a leader to another belay setting up an anchor, bringing up the second and doing that over and over. And then sometimes the climbing is hard enough, you actually climb directly on the ropes and the equipment that you place in the mountain, and that's aid climbing. So to look at these on a continuum, um, you'll see that if you're going to go really fast, so that's speed plus, okay? So I'm gonna be over here. This is speed, okay? And, but I don't care about security, that's soloing. If you want a little more security, you're gonna to have to cut your speed down, that's gonna be a running belay. If you want even more security, your speed is gonna be diminished even further and that's belayed climbing. And then last of all, the most secure in a sense, but the, less, but the, but the least quick would be using a fixed rope or aid climbing. So because speed is safety, not necessarily security, but speed, um, we have to go up and down this continuum. Sometimes we will solo fifth class if it's appropriate for the people that are there and the exposure. And sometimes we'll use a fixed rope on third class <laughs> because it's not appropriate to do something else for the people that are there or the conditions or the exposure. All right, let's talk about training a little bit. How many of you train currently? Show of hands for anything other than like chess or, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I mean like something sort of sport. Okay, so let's just go around the room. What do you train for? Running, okay. Um, um, cycling, but I endurance mostly for this, and I'm working with the Okay, good. Climbing. Okay. <laughs> Rock climbing, in gym climbing, okay. Rock climbing. Rock climbing. Cycling, hiking. Okay. Daily walking, hiking. Walking, hiking. Okay. Now, your definition of training is, you know, everyone has a different definition, so. Are you working out with in mind because a specific objective is in your future? And mountaineering will give that for give that to you 
forever. So if you want to be scared into working out, this is a good sport to get into. <laughs> you set your sights on, oh, I've got to be ready for this event, right? This expedition, this climb, whatever. So you'll be motivated because it's a matter of safety and success and also um, how confident you're going to be out there. So there's a couple parts. Aerobic conditioning is probably the most important. Your cardiovascular system has to be strong. Um, and you need to be able to do that for a long time. So basically it's cardio endurance, okay? Um, also, it requires a certain amount of strength. So some level of weightlifting is important, but um, not bulky weights and not powerlifting. We're talking about, of course, high reps, low weight, you know? So endurance strength as well. Also, nutrition is key, no, no surprise, like in every sport. But one of the upsides of mountaineering is you burn so many calories that it's almost, you can almost eat anything, even when you're training and definitely on the climb. Okay. And then you need to be a person who can recover quickly because lots of times you don't sleep well, you're not eating very well, you have to go for long stretches of time. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so you got to be a little tough with that. You know, you, you should be able to go with little sleep and in difficult, possibly hostile conditions for a while. It helps. So, okay. Some of the things you're going to need to to be able to do, um, in addition to that, is um, figure out how to set up a base camp, how to work stoves, cook sets, um, set up tents in bad weather. So that's all kind of camp craft. You can learn on training courses like Mountain One or just doing that on your own in the off season, <laughs> which is you know anytime from now until April, I guess. And then. Um, there's a couple key things that happen in mountaineering. We often go without tents. We do what's called a bivouac. So we'll sleep out with something less than our full complement of sleeping equipment. It might just be curled up by a tree with a space blanket, or it could be an actual bivy sack with a pad. Um, but in any case, sometimes we're just kind of sleeping on the route. And then um, water and food planning and preparation are also some big considerations in terms of the camping we do. There is no gourmet cooking in mountaineering. OK, if you are a type of backpacker like like I was uh, way back when I actually was taught how to bake bread and make pizzas and raise dough and, you know, and, and desserts and Dutch oven cooking and all that stuff. I, I love that stuff. But in mountaineering, it's anything that can be rehydrated and doesn't freeze rock solid. That's what I eat. So um, navigation and route finding are also um, important elements that you're going to need to do out there. So. Um, we have a course designed for that too. The whole mountaineering ser series is that. And why I broke these two up is because when you're moving on the land, that's navigation where there's a trail and there's signs and a map. But when you go off trail and you try to find your way someplace that has no markers on the route, that's route finding. It's the same process, but it's different. Um, it's a different sort of skill set. So of course, route finding is the more difficult of the two. That's the one that really makes or breaks the climb. A couple, I want to throw in a couple common errors in route finding that happen out there. Um, misinterpretation or emphasis on route descriptions. So you read it and you take what's written in the guidebook as gospel. Okay. Now this happens not not just in mountaineering, but in anything outdoors, backpacking or kayaking, whatever. You now where's that particular thing I was looking for, and how come they are always able to do it faster than I am? You know, guidebook time. Is that real? And can you actually climb the route in three hours? Why did it take me five and a half? You know? <laughs> um, in the alpine environment, it's often easier to go downhill than uphill. And you can inadvertently gravitate toward gullies without knowing it. That's why an altimeter is important so you can keep rain, maintain an elevation. Also, inaccurately assessing terrain and lump that with the next one, which is misjudging your progress. If somebody asks you how far do you think we've gone and you want to say, I think we've ascended 1,000 feet, just cut it in half right away because you've usually only gone half as far or half as fast as you think you have. This is my personal interpretation of how I, how I deliver that, the answer to that question. Maybe you're more accurate than I am. And then sec, the lastly, this one is one of the hardest, failing to recognize and correct your mistakes. And they can be some big doozies sometimes, okay? Big, big doozies. Like the whole trip could be over because you forgot to bring an extra pair of gloves. Or um, maybe you did your math wrong on the approach or you didn't read your compass right. I mean, there's thousands of things that could go wrong and, and, and they're all going to diminish your chances of safety and success. So, 
Right. <laughs> and I've pretty much done them all. The only thing I haven't left behind is my boots. I'm waiting for that one to happen someday. But I've left pretty much everything else out at some point. And I've made all those mistakes. I've gotten lost, you know, and all that stuff's happened. So it's just experience. Here's some tips and tricks for you. Um, this is a good one. Be moderate all day long in your activity level. Not really fast, not really slow, just moderate. Um, this is a nice thing for not just winter camping, but any anytime you're out, you're going to generate moisture in your clothing. Put in your sleeping bag at night and even better sleep in your clothes. OK, so it's extra insulation as long as you don't get sweaty. Um, here's a nice one. Place a bottle filled with hot liquid in your sleeping bag before you go to bed. Not just for snow campers anymore. Um, your water can be stored upside down to avoid freezing the threads. If you didn't know that stuff freezes from the top. So make sure those threads are on the bottom. Put on a fresh pair of socks when you arrive at camp. Note to self, always bring a fresh pair of socks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this is a good one. You know, there's a, quite a few ways you can lose heat. One of the worst is conduction, which is when your body or your clothing attached to your body is, is directly in contact with a cold surface. And that includes your feet. So if you're, you can suck your, your warmth right out the soles of your boots. So the more distance you have between you and the snow or the ice, the better. So that's why sleeping pads are important. Um, you can cook on them. You can sit on them. Um, avoid cotton. You guys know that, right? Okay, that, that's a bad, that's the bad outdoor fabric. You don't want to use that one anywhere. Unless you want something that soaks up water. In that case, like mopping up your tent, cotton works great for that, if you happen to have any. Couple other things. You're gonna to need to know about avalanches. Um, we're doing some avalanche courses this year. All of our courses with Sierra Mountain Guides that we've um, worked with them on are all full, but we're gonna be offering some more through the Tahoe Backcountry Ski Patrol and possibly some more through Alpine Skills, Skills International. So it's a great bunch of training to have. Um, I'm not gonna give you an avalanche presentation tonight, but I just wanna give you a little bit, some teaser about what we talk about when we discuss avalanches. You know, we're out there looking for triggers, unstable snow, and people who are traveling in areas where those, those can combine to create an avalanche. So in mountaineering, we often stay out of those slopes that even have the potential to avalanche, but we need to have the information. We need to know what degree of slope it is, what the weather pattern's like. We need to be able to dig pits and find out the instabilities, then make good group decisions so we can stay out of those places. And even if uh, we ex have to experience an avalanche, we need to know how to dig our buddies out and find them and use beacons. So that is part of the, the sport peripherally. And definitely if you're including skiing. All right, a couple of things, some features. We have this weird vernacular. Right? And when I say, all right, you know, we need to, first we're gonna go up the Arete, then we'll catch a Kuar, past the Bergschrund. You know, people are like, what, what language are you talking? Um, so here's a couple of terrain features for you. One of the ones that we uh, talk about the most in this list is a ret, which is C, and it's designated as a rock a ret because there is also ice a ret. So that's basically a uh, a knife edge ridge. It's it's more precipitous and exposed than a ridge. So it's the type where you could possibly straddle it with a leg off of each side. So that's what we refer to as an a ret. Um, Crevasses, seracs, I think those are pretty self-explanatory. A serac is where multiple crevasses cross and create a standing block of ice that's going to fall. That's one of the reasons why the um, Everest is very dangerous going through the Kumbu ice fall because of all the seracs there. They're unstable and they can fall at any time. Um, a couple terms like S, coal, pass, saddle, it's all the same stuff. Depends on what part of the country you come from. Um, and the others are, are pretty self-explanatory. Cornice. That's an overhanging lip of snow. Here's some more. One of my favorites is that first one there, T. That is pronounced couar. Okay, not coolier or cooler. Um, it's a Welsh word, and it denotes a steep, narrow-sided chute on a mountain that's usually um, rimmed by rock. Okay, so it's also called a. By if you're a skier, you would call it a chute. Um, if it's lower angle, it can be called a gully, okay? But kuar is a more, is the term that climbers usually use, okay? Um, Bergschrund, German word. 
that's the mother crevasse at the top of the glacier. So it's the big baddie. That you, when getting off the glacier up onto the head wall, which would be Y or AA, you usually have to cross a bergschrund. So that's one of the main barriers in mountaineering. Um, case in point would be the U-notch in the Palisades. Um, the, the ice climb itself is great. The rock route at the top of it is also fantastic. But the part that gives people trouble and headaches coming and going is getting onto the route from the glacier at the bottom because it's often overhanging and um, difficult and steep. So that's V, Bergschrund. And uh, there's your Iseret CC. And Gendarme or Towers DD, that's uh, over here. Um, that's a, I believe that's a French word, and uh, maybe Tom will correct me if he's listening tonight, um, that comes from a policeman that's on a tower. So in the square, they would have them up on a post and they'd be directing traffic. So that, that, that's a gendarme. Okay, so that's where that term came from. So it's basically, a, it's a post or a tower shape. All right, so now you're all up to date. So if I tell you that we're gonna climb the North Kuar, um, linking up to the Northeast Arete on the ice face with extensive flutings, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so some other things you need to know. Glaciers, what a wonderful landform. I love them and uh, they're amazing and otherworldly. Uh, luckily, we have a few here in um, California. The big ones that I like and that are most prevalent are the Whitney and the Hotland, both on Shasta. You see the two of them here. Um, this one here is the Whitney, okay? It's the big one with these big crevasses. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. It's actually over here. This one's the Bolum. This one is the Whitney Glacier over here. You can't see it. And this one is the Hotlum here with its distinctive head wall. Then the other one is the Palisade Glacier, which is already mentioned in the Palisades. And there's there are many, many others, but those are the biggest. Yeah, sure is. So Hotlum is the steepest, most crevassed. The Whitney is the longest. And the Palisade is the biggest in terms of mass. So that's my, that's my tick list for you. A um, couple knots you're going to need to know in mountaineering. We're just going right through it different topics. Here's one, figure eight on a bite. Uh, and the figure eight, yeah, that's figure eight on a bite. And the figure eight follow through, that's to tie in, okay? Um, we do a whole seminar on knots. So anytime, anywhere, we'll, we'll work on them. We work on them on trainings too. This is um, great, something you can always do at home to help increase your mountaineering skill. But I'm just gonna sh just go through them tonight just so you know what sort of knots we use in mountaineering. Another one that isn't well known, but I think should be used more is the taut line hitch. This is a, a, a knot that you can tie on a guy line on a tent where it can be tensioned without untying it. So the reason that's important is when you get your tent set up and you lay out your guy lines for the snow load and the wind you may expect, you tie a taut line hitch. And then as the conditions worsen or improve, you can adjust the tension on your tent without untying your knots all over again. You just slide that little uh, grippy part of it that looks like a prusik, you know, like a grapevine. It's wrapped around a couple times. You just slide that up and back. Another knot that's pretty specific to mountaineering is the butterfly knot. This is one of my favorites. This is a way to tie in in the middle of a rope. It's also called the alpine butterfly. Very fun knot to tie. Um, there are a couple friction hitches. The two most important, I think, one of them is Klem heist, which is a German word, not climb heist, but Klem heist, okay? And that one is a one directional prusik that's easy to tie. Like, like it shows here, you just hold the uh, loop, do a couple wraps, feed the end up through the top and bring it back down. And so it's basically a, a wrap with a girth hitch on top. So a, as you pull down where the carabiner's there in that picture, um, it will tension all of those wraps and create enough friction so you can climb up as it's oriented in this picture. If you need something to protect you uh, for both directions, then you use the good old Prusik or Prusik. And this is actually an old sailing knot that climbers have taken on as their own. And uh, it takes some time to tie, and you have to have a specific, like the Clem Heist, a specific piece of cord to do so, but that's a great knot to tie also. Okay, another one would be the Munter hitch. This is a knot that you use when you don't have a belay device or to provide some friction on the rope. 
it both feeds in and takes out rope on the same knot because it flips around the carabiner. So it provides friction two different directions. So it's a fantastic knot. Also, once again, from sailing, in the world of sailing, that's how they would tie down sheets on old ships. It's a German word. And there's the good old bowlin, which was an old way of tying in before the figure eight follow through was devised, I suppose, but still a great knot for tying anything like hitching up a boat, bow line, right? Or a horse or a tree or a tent peg, okay? Or a tent. Square knot is somewhat untrust untrustworthy knot, but um, because you can tie it wrong, which we would call a thief knot, and it would come undone. But um, this is a great all-purpose knot that's fun to tie, and it's very symmetrical. That's the knots. How many of you know at least half of those knots? Show of hands. A quarter of them. At least one of them. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> You're on your way. Okay, guys. So we've got to go on to uh, some gear stuff here. So first thing is, I'm going to talk about 10 essentials. Um, this is applicable to a lot of outdoor things. Um, I've probably spent way too much time thinking about this and, and talking about it over the years in different seminars and things. And uh, I, I gave it a shot at trying to put them all in words that end in shun. And I almost made it all the way to the end. Um, but I've got navigation, insulation, nutrition, medication, illumination, combustion, preparation, radiation, filtration, and communication. And that pretty much covers it. Those are systems, not discrete items. And so if you think about what am I going to need to navigate? What am I going to need to, what am I going to, need to have to insulate? So my, my list is kind of up there. Some of the things we're going to bring are going to be a little bit different than what you might bring if you were backpacking or camping. Um, for example, let's see. How about uh, insulation? It's sometimes discussed as extra clothes. Okay? For me, that means at least a balaclava, you know, something that covers my head. Um, it could also mean, if I have room, a belay jacket, which would be like a puffy that you put on over, over your, your action suit, you know, your, your Gore-Tex or your nylon soft shell while you're climbing. Because when you're at the belay, you're cold, you, you've been climbing, and then you stop suddenly to belay your partner. And then you put on this jacket to keep you warm and conserve that heat. You take it back off when you climb again, stuff it in your pack. So that's the kind of stuff that's different. Um, nutrition. <sighs> I just have energy bars, you know, <laughs> so that's it. Um, I have multiple headlamps under illumination. Uh, let's see here, under shelter, um, it might not be a tent at all. It might just be an emergency bivy sack, you know, like the pack, like the size of a pack of cigarettes. They, they cost five bucks or they could cost 150 bucks. Depends on how robust you want your bivy to be. But that, that counts as shelter. Or maybe it's just a space blanket with grommets, that is your that is your shelter. Okay, it's also your extra clothing. So there's ways that we that we we cut some of the list down. But one of the things I would never head out in, into mountaineering with without would be I'd never head out without a headlamp, no matter what kind of trip it is. I would never go without a knife. I'd never go without a map. Um, those are probably the ones I'd always take. And well, not even a compass. A, a map is more important. So, okay, but that's up to you. And then down at the bottom there, that last little tiny bullet, an ice axe is not on the official list of 10 essentials, but it's useful for so many things. It takes the place of all the trekking poles um, because you can use it for, you know, leg braces, stability, self-arrest. You can use it for anything that requires a, a long vertical stiff rod like rescue. Um, you can use it as a weapon <laughs> to fend off animals or your <laughs> enraged partner. <laughs> um, you can chop snow and ice with it. You can cut trails. Um, it's really useful. There's a reason why it's still being used. Okay, let's talk about water a little bit. It's a little harder to get in the mountain environment because often it's locked up in snow and ice. So, and I often see people bringing too much water with them. But that, again, depends. Some people we climb with, one man in particular I'm thinking of, he, he carries four liters pretty much regularly all the time. And I carry three quarters of a liter pretty much regularly all the time. Um, I, I try to, I never take more than a liter and a half if I can avoid it. Um, I drink a lot before I go out. I'm dehydrated when I come back. And then I try to hydrate again. But since it, it, it's pretty much one of the more heavy things you're going to carry. So 
um, try to consume a lot but carry very little. And then one thing you're going to need to know is how to find water and melt it. Um, number one, finding it would be dipping out of streams or you know cutting into ice lakes or something. But then most importantly and more prominently, melting snow, and that takes a long time. And there is kind of an art to it. So if you want to learn how the art of melting snow, I'd recommend that Mountain 2 is coming up, which is our winter mountaineering training. That's where we do that kind of thing. <laughs> and there's a whole process of finding it, quarrying it, getting it in the pot, not spilling it, not boiling it, but just melting it, pouring it into bottles, and doing all that, possibly only in your vestibule. Okay? You can do that while you're in your sleeping bag, in your vestibule, in a, in a storm. So, how about good old food? No cinnamon rolls and backcountry pizza here. But there are some things you can do to make it more than just mountain house. Um, here's a couple of things I have um, that we've talked about these in seminars in the past. But one of the one of the best is liquid calories. So you can get sports drinks you can mix into your water, and that helps you to get both energy and hydration at the same time. It's a powder form. It weighs very little. You can get all kinds of flavors. Then there's of course the goo thing. There's all a there's all kinds of jelly beans and sport beans and tablets and waffles and chewables and squishables. <laughs> you can you you guys have used this stuff and some of it is really gross. But if you like a flavor, bring that one. My mantra is never bring more than one thing. So if I'm gonna bring a chocolate goo. I'll also bring a vanilla and a strawberry. And then if I'm going to do trail bars, I'll do Tiger Milk, um, Power Bar, Luna Bar, Cliff Bar, and different flavors in all of them. So I don't eat anything more than once. Because it's hard enough when you've got altitude working on you to have a whole pack full of the same flavor of thing, right? <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> it's a unique form of torture. Um, I guess the last thing to say about this is, it's okay to go heavy on carbs and fats, and that means like live it up, you know, like bacon and chocolate and heavy salt and all that stuff. I, you know, without going overboard, but that you need that stuff, um, especially if you're going to be out in cold environments. Your body's working hard and it's going to need some power. And a green salad just doesn't do it. It doesn't pack well. So, all right. Any any, any thoughts or comments on? I just went through a whole slew of stuff. You guys got any add-ons? Comments? No? Okay. Come up with a lot of donut party jokes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, let's go to, let's talk about clothing a little bit. We often discuss this in seminars, so I'm going to be very brief on this. I might just kind of stop at a slide for a couple seconds, and if there's anything of note, we'll, we'll linger there. If not, we'll move on. Um, I wanted to make sure tonight kind of moved quickly. Um, so I guess this is probably the first slide to start with, which is that when you're thinking about your sum total of how, what sort of equipment, gear, and clothing you use, I like you to think of it as an entire system. So I break it up into three components. There's the clothing itself, which is what you wear. There's the equipment, which is everything that you use to help you stay safe and warm and dry that's not attached to your body. And then there's your gear, which is all of your technical stuff. So tent would be equipment, rope would be gear, a jacket would be clothing. There's different reasons for us, different, there's different requirements for each of those things. So clothing is probably the most important of them. Um, likely you can start with what you've already got. I get this question a lot like, okay, I wanna get into mountaineering, what do I need to buy? And my first thing is keep all the clothes you have because they'll probably already be okay, especially if you've already been backpacking and camping or skiing, usually they're fine. The thing that makes a difference is really footwear. That's the key thing to get. Um, if you're going to buy clothing, however, I would say the key things to look at for materials are soft shell, which is this sort of material. It's stretchy, warm, very breathable. Next most important and useful is down. And then going down the list, polyester, wool for sure, and then nylon itself. And I'd say you need multiple layers for each part of your body. And not that you have to take them all, but like I say here, Lower body, two layers, upper body, three, two sets of hand and headwear. And um, especially if it's an overnight, I'd bring a pair of, an extra pair of socks or an extra pair of liners. So that's your arsenal, okay? Here's the clothing uh, starting at the top. 
um, some recommended manufacturers or distributors uh, on the right here. And then um, some of the things, a, a balaclava and a toque are probably the minimal pieces of equipment you'll want. Um, you'll probably want a pair of gloves and a pair of mittens, maybe multiple pairs of gloves that have um, that slide inside each other and have different weights and, and capabilities. It's nice to have a pair of gloves that are waterproof and insulating and another pair of gloves that are got better dexterity and are stretchy. So for the different different reasons you'd use them, one of them for climbing, the other one for in camp. And then, of course, base layers, they should be wicking, they should be breathable. And often you'll want to have um, an ability to convert them from long sleeve to short or zip them or something like that. And possibly even put more than one base layer on so that you can take multiple base layers on or off. So it doesn't mean it's only one layer. It just means that's the base layer component system. Um, and we can, we can get to um, mid layers too, which could be fleece, could be soft shell, which I totally recommend. And all this stuff is on the walls behind us here, down, polyester. Main thing of this layer, it's got to be breathable, and it should trap air so that it keeps your heat in. But again, you have to uh, be careful about overdoing it. I know when I first started climbing, uh, this is my little joke, I had, I had lots of great gear that was really heavy, and I had a thin wallet, okay? okay? And then as I learned more, I got gear that was lightweight and thin and my wallet became fat instead so don't spend a lot of money on gear you don't need don't go out buying 8,000 meter down suit to climb castle peak for example okay or a 90 liter this is these are kind of things i did a, a, a 90 liter pack you know that costs a lot of money for mountaineering because that's too much or fully insulated rigid boots with three eyelets over the ankle if you're going to just be scrambling okay so pick the right stuff and usually it's just a little bit more robust than what you've been using for backpacking the outer layer this is one place where you are going to have to spend some money because you do need to have something that's waterproof at least in your pack and um, although you might not be wearing it very much in the sierra but full zip pants helmet compatible hood definitely pockets um, definitely um, something that is uh, gives you a freedom of movement when you climb and uh, pick a good one. Then the, the blade jacket and um, the whole breathable um, revolution of soft shell and so on. I, I, I particularly like soft shell because it changed the way I climbed. Back, back in the late 90s when I first started doing this pretty seriously, everything I had was fleece. If you guys were active outdoors during that time, you may remember the fleece revolution, Malden Mills and Gore-Tex, that was the bomb, okay? But now Softshell has, in a sense, replaced both of those in functionality because it's stretchy and warm and can even be made waterproof, but um, it's just so much better than, than fleece and shell jackets. <laughs> It's just it, the whole system has been turned on its side. So I recommend you, you get soft shell with pretty much everything, okay? And down. I, I bought my first down jacket not many years ago, and I don't know how I did it so long with only synthetic. <laughs> it's great too, but down is so awesome, right? You guys own a down sleeping bag? Isn't that a dream to climb into your down sleeping bag at night? Oh, man, I love it. All right, a few more things. Socks, definitely wool. Uh, you're going to need gaiters. They can be uh, high or low, either way. Here's where I want to stop for a little bit. Boots. This is a great conversation. What to do with boots? So how many of you, you already have backpacking boots, I'm thinking. Some sort of outdoor hiking boot above the ankle support, right? Okay, will that boot work for mountaineering? Yes, it will. But it won't work as well as a mountaineering boot, and here's why. Number one, a boot that's built for walking doesn't climb snow and ice very well because it flexes at the forefoot. So what you want for mountaineering is a boot that's got a rigid or semi-rigid shank. So that means that when you step on it, it's not going to flex. However, when you kick into the snow, it'll do the work for you and you can stand up on a toehold. So probably the best thing to do is get a boot that's got a three-quarter shank, like this one here in the picture. This is the Trango Los, Los, Los Trango series. 
And Gregor's got them on the wall here. That's the boot I've climbed in for 13 years. I love it. You might not fit La Sportiva, so there's other brands that are listed, but a three quarter shank uh, boot like that, two eyelets over the ankle, waterproof, crampon compatible. That's the perfect boot to get, in, to get started in mountaineering. A boot like that will climb rock pretty well. It'll do good on snow and it's decent enough on ice. They do cost a couple hundred bucks, but they always go on sale and they're always getting out new colors. And they're definitely less expensive than double boots or full winter mountaineering or ice climbing boots. Do you use those on the approach as well? Yeah, you can, you can walk in with them. You can climb the route with them up to maybe even 5'8 if you're good enough. You can climb almost up to, you can climb vertical ice in them, but maybe not many pitches. And you can definitely do any snow route with them. So it's just one, one boot to do it all. And they've gotten amazingly light. I mean, the mountaineering boots nowadays of this type, um, they're around two pounds, you know, which is shocking. I mean, Each. yeah, yeah. Or maybe less. I mean, but, but, but they're, they're light. I mean, you pick them up, you're like, wow, this is, this is great. Um, and if you have any, if you guys have been doing this for a while, you remember back in the day of the, the full, full Rand sewn on full leather boots. I've had backpacking boots in the past that weighed more than my mountaineering boots now, nowadays do. So that's key. So mountaineering boots are important. That's your most important decision and you're probably your most important first purchase. Unfortunately, the one thing that the club really can't provide for you, okay, is we just don't have the ability or it would be kind of silly to have a whole fleet of boots. But um, I would, I'd recommend that you spend some time doing researching it and, and trying them on. So just to take a little survey again, how many of you right now do own mountaineering boots? Okay, so let's go around the room and just, just talk about what was your process briefly? I mean, how did you decide what you did? Give us 15 seconds. How did you decide in the boots you got? Well, I have like white feet, so I knew that I needed a white fit, so I basically just used the mountaineering boots white. Okay. And then I came to a brand, Salua, and they actually have their own. So unlike like the Sportiva, where you might get the Trango and you get it in a white, they actually have their own range of like okay. boots in white. Cool. So I just bought like five pairs of those. And <laughs> put them all, on. all right, great. But that's a good story because feet are so unique. They're so crazy shapes, shapes and some brands just don't fit people. So that's going to be your brand. Probably mine is Sportiva, for example, Who, a couple other folks. Yeah. Well, I just bought Vasks. So you bought Vasks. Okay. Wanted leather, boots, you wanted leather. Okay, cool. Suck, so. Oh, really? <laughs> well, Vask is a great brand, but yeah, no, they just don't fit me very well. that's the problem. Okay. So, so you gotta, sometimes you gotta buy multiple sizes and try them out and send the ones that don't fit back. I know that's the strategy some people have done. Do you have the hike in long distance somewhere? Uh huh. Those boots like that that are stiff, they kind of eat my feet. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, the, the boots that are stiff will eat your feet. So if you get a full shank boot, like talking La Sportiva terms, like the Nepal Evo or one that has three eyelets over the ankle, um, something that's built really with insulation more for winter mountaineering, it's going to be difficult to hike more than 10 miles with those boots without just getting really beat up. Um, so yeah, you may have to, in that case, you may have to have a pair of shoes for the approach. So that's, this is why three quarter shank mountaineering boots are a good compromise in all angles. Cause they do a lot of things really well and they do everything to some degree, including the approach. So they have a little bit of flex. So do you recommend one that goes over 46? Like, you, oh, size 46? Yeah, it's lost because he was one small. You know, um, I would say that um, Garmont, Garmont is, is a good brand that a lot of people who have had bigger, longer feet have been ha happy with. Um, there's also up there listed Oslo, okay? But there are a lot of good brands. Um, Scarpa is another good one. Uh, the other three listed up there are all worth looking into, Millet and Mammut. Um, some of them are, are pretty uh, reasonable in price too. There's another one called Mad Rock, which is a pretty, uh, which pretty reasonably priced boot, pretty decent. So, and you know what? Uh, right now is a good time because uh, they, the retail world kind of feels like mountaineering boots sell best in the spring. And so they're gonna be trying to get rid of their old models. So this is a good time to buy them this time of year. 
Here's a couple of things you're going to need. You're going to need some glasses that protect you from the extreme radiation out there. And this is a good place to sink some money. Um, pretty much Jewelable is the only one to go with, in my opinion. <laughs> Bobcat sells them here. One of the things you're going to need, a lot of this stuff you may already have. Um, but, you know, like I mentioned, a good headlamp, an altimeter, barometer, compass watch, um, or possibly a compass with a mirror, um, collapsible bottles, a belay knife, etc. This stuff um, is important to have. Stuff sacks. You can get this little at a time, and, and all of it crosses over into other sports. So it's multi-use. Helmets. Uh, I did want to... They're over there on the wall. I think I'll just kind of talk about them real briefly. There, there's basically two types of helmets in the climbing world right now. And I want to just point out that um, for mountaineering, typically we want to look at a helmet that can withstand multiple hits. So we're looking for a hard shell helmet with a framework and foam between the framework and the shell. Some helmets that are sold nowadays in climbing, they are UIAA approved but they're really more for sport climbing and they're kind of like glorified bicycle helmets. So they're good for that one hit, but lots of, lots of times in mountaineering where there's one rock flying, there'll be many others and maybe multiple encounters with loose rocks or dangerous situations. So you wanna have a pretty robust helmet that can take a beating, take a lick and keep on ticking. So just look for the hard shell types on the outside and they should have a framework on the inside as well as a hard plastic outer shell and foam. Some other things, of course, you're going to need a harness. Your rock climbing harness will work, but a mountaineering specific harness will probably work better. Um, all of this stuff like runners and ropes and all of this specificity of what you should get, we can help you with. Um, we go in pretty ludicrous detail in this stuff in some courses and climbing events. And a lot of the ELs and myself will happily discuss ad nauseum about which runner or, <laughs> or device you should get over another. But Bobcat sells all this stuff. We have a great discount here has um he's our retail partner so this is the place to get it and he can order anything you need for that but again the club has got this stuff so that's part of what your membership pays for um you're going to want specific types of carabiners locking and non and um not all of them work great because we have the added element of snow and ice and a lot of carabiners aren't designed with that in mind they're just kind of all around crag beaners and we're talking about you know stuff that might get frozen or you might have to operate with mittens on, then it narrows the scope down a little bit. And, and as well, um, we are pretty specific about what sort of belay device you're gonna need. Uh, the one that's pictured here is an ATC XP guide. That's the one that currently I think is one of the better ones. It allows you to belay in a number of configurations and also execute rescues that you wouldn't be able to do if you had a more simple device. So that's key. Crampons are key too. That's a more some one of the more important components of the sport. Um, they should be at least 10 to 12 point crampons. Strap-ons will be great. But the key thing is that they work with the boot that you've got. This has happened a lot that folks have got the mountaineering boot and gotten a pair of crampons and didn't pay attention to the interface between the two. And there's three different ways that they could be attached. It could be, could be strap-on, it could be heel only, or it could be um strap on heel oh and heel and toe so you know those are the three different ways so there's make sure the boot you buy is compatible with crampons and and likewise same thing with tools slash axes there is difference between ice tools and ice axes generally they're all called ice axes but when they get to be short and curved and more technical that's an ice tool and there are used for different things so Snowshoes, trekking poles, shovels, all this stuff um, can be acquired a little at a time, but it's useful for year-round trekking poles year-round, the other two, for winter mountaineering and getting to and from the mountain. Sleeping bags and mats and bivy sacks and pads, whatever you buy, it should be robust, should be able to withstand um, pretty low temps and last a while. Um, often multiple pads is necessary and multiple types of sleeping bags because some of the environments we climb in would be wet like the North Cascades or Canada and some would be dry like here in the Sierra. And so down and synthetic both have qualities that make them appealing but you might not want to use the same type of bag all year round. One way to get around that 
is to buy a bag that is adequate for three quarters of the year and then insulate that bag for winter climbing with a liner and wearing your clothing in the bag. So that, that's one way I would get around having to own multiple bags. Same thing with packs. Basically, the size we're looking for is around 40 liters. That's the magic number. 30 is a little tight and 50 is a little big. And if you can have a pack for every 10 liters from 10 to 60, that would be fantastic. But <laughs> if you're going to have only one by a 40, if you're going to have two by a 30 and a 50. If you're going to have three, then you can get whatever you want. <laughs> Does it, make sure they're designed for climbing. So again, they're stripped down. They don't have a lot of bells and whistles. They're pretty minimalistic. And they're, they're lightweight with ISAX attachments and modular features that you can pull off the lid and pull the frame sheet out and maybe take off the waist belt. Beast of burden. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So same thing. Um, the good old jet boil will work pretty well in most situations. Up till about 10,000 feet will start to diminish a little bit as compared to white gas. And or when you're melting snow, it's not so good because the pot's small in the standard configuration. And it's a, it's not a reusable canister. So I prefer white gas. I think it's a little better in, in all around situations, but they're both useful. And don't be afraid of white gas. I know it takes a little bit of time to learn how to prime it and use it, but it's well worth it. And it's a stove you can use all around the world, especially if you buy the international types. You can burn kerosene or av fuel or auto gas or whatever, whatever country you're in. Alcohol, alcohol stoves never really enter into the picture with mountaineering. Um, unless there's, unless you can use like a white gas configuration and burn it in that tank. But if you're talking about like the, the pop can type lightweight alcohol stoves that light and fast backpackers use, no, they don't really have enough power to melt snow or warm up the food, the, in my opinion. So pretty much need to have a, this is one place where you can't really save a lot of weight and it's an important safety tool anyway. So other gear you're going to need, what we got here pictured is pickets, also known as um, snow stakes, ice screws, nuts, tri cams, camelots, you know, um, all this stuff we use in various situations and we'll go over in certain trainings. And you can learn it a little at a time. The club owns all this gear and we, we loan it out for our, our um, members on official events. This is part of the fun stuff because it's fun gear. It's fun to place it. It's great to use it. It's all shiny and well, at least in the beginning. <laughs> Pretty awesome stuff. If you're kind of a tech geek, uh, gear geek like I am, you love this kind of stuff. Tents are important too. You got to make sure that the Walmart tent that you're taking out there, you know, just know that it's probably not going to work when the chips are down. Um, you're going to have to lay some money down for it. It doesn't have to be a double wall or a winter mountaineering tent, but it needs to be able to be hauled in and be snow worthy at some point. So guidelines are important and a vestibule is important. Full coverage rain fly is important. Those are kind of the, the highlights. Um, you can get away with things like floorless tents because you can dig them into the snow or even a wing or, you know, like a, a tarp like we show here. But um, they aren't so good um, outside of a certain range of conditions. So because tents are more all conditions gear, I think they're probably more useful. Um, in special circumstances, though, you can cut weight by using these. I want to take you on a little tour around certain places you can go to do all this stuff once you've got all the elements in place. One that we're going to this weekend is Donner Peak. It's on Old Highway 40 just outside of Truckee. It's got a great north face and some cool rocks up top. Then there's good old Castle Peak, which was mentioned just earlier. You can see the three turrets there. You drive right by this on Interstate 80. Um, the Summit is the furthest right in this picture, and it's got a nice little third, fourth class scramble at the top and two bolts so you can wrap off the summit. It's a fun place. We go there for Mountain too. Also, Mount Talak, which is uh, kind of the monarch of Lake Tahoe area. It's got that big wide saddle you see there is actually the North Bowl where a lot of skiing takes place, and the cliffs to the left of that is where we climb up through the Cross Kuar and lots of great opportunities for mountaineering there <coughs> as long as the brush isn't too bad. Um, same thing with Pyramid Peak, which is just off of Highway 50. It's 10,000 feet. You can climb it year round. There's all kinds of things you can do there. Yeah. 4,000 feet later. Yeah, 4,000 feet later. But yeah, it's tough. It is. It's, it's a local trading peak. <laughs> so, and it's accessible. Yeah. Um, going a little further afield down south, 
we've got Baldi, Gregorio, and San Jacinto. San Jacinto is one of the best. It has the distinction of having one of the tallest prominence peaks in the United States. It's got 10,000 feet of rise from cactus to clouds, you know, like the trail denotes. And so it's a it's a monster of a mountain. Gregorio is at 11, and I think Baldi's somewhere below that. Um, so there is things to do down in SoCal that qualify as real mountains, even though they don't get a lot of snow. Um, certain times of the year, they'll feel like anything else in the Sierra. Then, of course, the High Sierra, there's at least 15, 14,000 foot peaks and multiple 13ers, hundreds of subsidiary peaks below those, of course. And so a whole lifetime's worth of stuff there. And then uh, are the volcanoes we're blessed to have in this state, the southern half of the Cascade Range would be Mount Shasta, Lassen Peak. And then, of course, our own special peak of significance, which is Mount Whitney, that everybody wants to climb the tallest peak in the lower 48, um, is also a great peak and pretty reminiscent of lots of great climbing we have in the Sierra. Great weather, trailheads are accessible. The snow, if it happens, is good snow. <laughs> the rock is awesome, and there's tons of routes. Um, moving farther afield, Rainier, Hood, and Jefferson moving up the chain to Washington. The entire Cascade Range itself, including at least six to nine more volcanoes in Oregon that I'm not listing here, are all great to climb in. Um, the range in Wyoming called the Tetons is one of America's best mountaineering destinations. There's another range just east of that called the Wind Rivers, which is little not, not very well known, but also has amazing um, routes. We're going to both, both of these ranges this year, actually, on expeditions for SMC. Then if we move further east in the United States and up into Canada, there's the Rockies. So they go all the way basically from Mexico up to northern Canada and include scores, hundreds of peaks and glaciers. The more, the better, the higher you go north. Um, and then the Wasatch Range, which is actually in Utah. No, I'm sorry. That one's in Colorado. That's the Swatch and Wasatch. They're both, they're both really close. <laughs> I forget which one's which. Wasatch is Utah. Swatch is in Colorado. I'm leaving some out, but these are some of the highlights. Uh, obviously, uh, moving up north is Alaska, which has multiple lifetimes worth of mountaineering there alone. Um, just crazy. Um, the Canadian Rockies, to put a point on the, the northern tip of the Rockies themselves, um, is probably a more accessible version of what you get in Alaska without all the cold temps. Um, the Cascades of Washington continue also up into Canada, so the Coast Range in BC and Rogers Pass and all of those ranges that are west of the Canadian Rockies, those are all places to go to. And then moving further south, we've got the volcanoes in Mexico like Cotopaxi or Azaba. And everything on this, every, every range we've gone through now, we're doing expeditions in this year as it turns out. Um, and probably will be for every year we, we're on it. Um, here's the one in particular, Denali, we're talking about now, just in that one area, which is a tiny portion of Alaska, you can see that there's just incredible opportunities. Hunter and Foraker, and it goes on and on. Here's Mount St. Elias, which is one of the largest land masses in, the, in uh, North America, in the world. Um, incredibly huge ranges up there. Um, some other places that you could go um, on your tick list that are across the world and some that we're going to is like the Andes, the longest mountain chain on earth. It goes all the way from basically Central America to the tip of the planet. Um, so it covers fully half of the planet in one long chain down the backbone of South America. The bottom tip of that's Patagonia, which is considered kind of the highlight of that chain. So it's incredible rock, ferocious weather, and amazing peaks. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get there someday. Africa's got a couple. Kilimanjaro was noted as being one of the tallest in the world. Um, the highest on that continent, I would say, rather. Um, that's its distinction. And then over in Europe, um, the Alps, of course, which is the birthplace of mountaineering, and then the Urals, which is kind of at the boundary between Asia and Europe. Those are um, kind of around Russia. Um, even further, Australia, New Zealand has got its own things. Um, hopefully, we're going to be sending an expedition to New Zealand in 2017. Um, and then Asia, not to be outdone, of course, has the highest mountains on Earth. Um, the Tian Shan is near China. The Karakoram is around Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, of course, the Himalaya, which is right around all those. Um, 
Antarctica even has its own um, mountains and important peaks. The one that most people know about there is Vincent Massif, which is the highest mountain in Antarctica, one of the seven summits. It's 15,000 feet and really cold. <laughs> There's another mountain I want to just talk about just real briefly, just for fun, which is Olympus Mons. Does anybody know where that is? Mars, right. It's the tallest mountain in the solar system. Compared to Everest and Hawaii, you can see that it is quite fantastically tall. It's about 16 miles high. So that puts it at like 80,000 feet. Um, it's about the size of the state of Arizona, and it has a cliff around the base of it that's five miles high. <laughs> <laughs> However, it's such a huge shield volcano. This, this graph doesn't really show what it looks like. The maximum degree, once you get above the five mile cliff, the maximum degree of the slopes is five degrees. So if you could get your rover to the top of the five mile cliff, you could drive to the top of the tallest mountain in the solar system at 88,000 feet, Olympus Mons. So I'm putting it on my tick list. So, so I'm just about done here, guys. So wrapping up with some of the things that, um, that the club can help you with. Um, our, our three main objectives are connecting with you know helping people find each other and then training and then climbing so um that's what we do and this these seminars are part of that and our love of mountaineering just kind of is infused into all of that there's a lot of benefits to happen um, when you get involved with mountaineering not just us but um you get to go places and meet people and do things and see stuff that you just can't see anywhere else so here's some pictures of a couple different trips and things that show what we do and um when you're in mountaineering itself and as we as we do it in the club you know some of our objectives are to help people have a foundation so they can do it themselves and build a kind of a core knowledge so that you've got the tools you need to get out there um, that involves technical physical and mental skills but also there's a social component too which is what's called expedition behavior so that's important, you know, being with people that you can trust and you like being around. And of course, to have a rewarding experience. I have just a real quickly, just overview of different courses that we have that help people. Um, the main one would be the mountaineering course. So mountain one is just general and basic mountaineering and just a tiny bit of technical climbing. Then mountain two is winter mountaineering and snow camping essentially, and more navigation. Then mountain three is really expedition mountaineering. So that's in the snow, moving through terrain, a little bit of technical uh, climbing on some easy mixed ground and um, the high level of navigation and understanding of systems to move through terrain. But there's also SIG, which is snow ice glacier courses. Somewhat similarly, level one is unroped, level two is roped and lead climbing, and level three is multi-pitch lead climbing glaciers. Um, rock would be rock one would be scrambling beginning climbing rock two would be anchors protection using ropes and rock three would be alpine multi-pitch and lead climbing in difficult situations here's some some books and websites what's that on your courses how do you handle say intermediate uh, folks that are coming in if you want to take say sig two is it a discussion to make sure that you yeah Qualify. Mm -hmm. Usually everything below level three will just take anybody who wants to register um, on the understanding that a good and uh, a conservative self-assessment is, is, is expected. Um, but often um, it, we haven't, yeah, often if, if somebody just out of the blue who we don't know is new to the club signs up for level 3.6 or something, you know, then I would call them up and say, okay, just want to make sure you understand this is a high level course that already has some things assumed but yeah you can sign up on any one that you wish to do so here's my, pretty much my last slide um here's a couple good books for you aside from mountaineering freedom of the hills um one of them is extreme alpinism which was a really uh, groundbreaking book back in the late 90s and still pretty applicable by mark twite um one of the bad boys of alpine climbing um, another one that I've really enjoyed by Mark Houston and Kathy Cosley is called Alpine Climbing Techniques to Take You Higher. And I found that this book really goes beyond what Freedom of the Hills talks about and um, from a guide's perspective and a decision-making perspective, discusses how you can 
go beyond just kind of the standard thing that's described in Freedom of the Hills, how to go lighter and faster and be a little smarter and um, get more done. Um, some great websites and um, resources online. ProLite Gear has got some amazing videos. They're a great retail store up north. Backpacking Light is actually pretty interesting um, organization I've been involved with to learn some tips and tricks. Outdoor Gear Lab provides amazing uh, reviews, and I consider them to be the most objective of all the reviews out there because they buy the equipment, they test, and they're a group of climbers that really do exactly that. They buy all this gear, they go out and test it, they thoroughly test it, and they tell you what they found out. There's no sales pitch, there's no marketing, there's no connection to any companies, there's no magazine subscription to sell you. So I trust them, and I'm using all of their um, I'm using all of their uh, reviews. Um, exclusively. Traditional mountaineering, outside online, Rock and Ice Magazine, those are just some others to look at. So, Guys, that's how you make the transition to mountaineering. <laughs> All right, so that's it for today.